Now, lawyers use a lot of legal terms. Funding means putting assets in the trust. And we'll explain very briefly what a living trust is and what we're talking about here, right? So only after you create this trust, which is a document, it's a written document signed, typically acknowledged before a notary public, also known as notarization, which isn't a real word, acknowledged before a notary public. But if you have a living trust, you got to put assets in the trust. So that it can only be funded after it's created. And they are not typically immediately funded when you sign that document. So a will, when you sign a will, you know, you're done. You, you sign it, that's it. With a living trust, you have to take additional steps after that. It's, it is kind of like a super will. And so you really do have to pay attention to your um, funding of the trust. I'm a partner at Cunningham Legal. I have over 25 years experience. We have offices throughout the state of California. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law, a real estate broker, securities insurance licensed, and a pilot. These are the lawyers in our law firm. So I'm my two partners, Rochelle and Tasha, and uh, the other attorneys in our firm, a great group of people. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and click subscribe and click the little bell, and you'll be alerted to when we release content on YouTube, which is typically Thursday at about 6 p.m. So if you're watching this and you're like, Jim, you talk too fast, or I need to see this again, it's going to be on YouTube at about 6 o'clock this evening. Disclaimer, I'm a lawyer. I'm talking. My lips are moving. This is absolutely not legal advice. So when I say you, there is no attorney-client relationship, okay? So it's a lot like Shark Tank. When you watch Shark Tank, no one's offering you any money. You're watching a TV show, so you're watching a video. This is not legal advice. So what is a living trust and what is a successor or future trustee? Because this is something very important to understand. A living trust is basically a container. It's a bucket. It's a bucket with a handle. And the trustee holds onto the handle. A trust has to have three things. It has to have a trustee. It has to have a trust corpus, and it must have a beneficiary. Now, if you are setting up a living trust, you set up this bucket, you're going to put your house, your stocks, your bonds, your mutual funds in there. You're going to hold on to that, that handle. You're the trustee of your living trust typically, and you're the beneficiary. And why do we do this? We do this simply to avoid probate and maintain privacy. It's very important to understand that a living trust is created for the benefit of the beneficiaries. This is hardwired into uh, Anglo-American law, right? Throughout the United States and in the English-speaking countries that have trusts, trusts are for the benefit of beneficiaries. Probate is for the benefit of your creditors. And a lot of people don't understand that, that there's the subtle nuances. Uh, there are different creditor claims procedures after somebody passes away. So probate, significantly more creditor-friendly, a living trust, significantly more beneficiary-friendly. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather have my assets go into my family rather than uh, you know, having to go through hoops to check in with my creditors to make sure they're paid off. So when you stop being trustee, that bucket, so you're holding on to the handle as trustee. When you stop being trustee, that bucket doesn't go away, right? Just because you are, don't have the handle anymore, that bucket is then transferred to the successor trustee. Now, the term successor trustee can be confusing. You're the trustee while you're alive. Your successor trustee is somebody who will serve in the future, potentially, right? This person will serve in the future, but they're not serving now. So successor trustee means future trustee. And it's really important to pay attention to the, the language that lawyers use, because if you hear the term successor trustee, typically it means someone who's not serving right now. So trustees are always trustees, successor trustees are future trustees, and um, much living trust, again, much better than probating a will. Funding your trust. The first thing we're going to talk about is real estate. And so I, I hear we have some real estate professionals watching this. We have a lot of people reserved or signed up for this webinar, which is great. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please share this with your friends. This, I would say, is probably the single most critical asset. If I could just pick the most important asset for the vast majority of our clients, it is making sure that the real estate gets into the trust. So you fund your trust. If you bought your real estate, your home, your commercial property, your multifamily, if you bought that before you created your trust and you create your trust, how do you get that into your trust? Well, you do it by deed. So in California and throughout the United States, real estate is transferred by deed. What that means is it is a piece of paper, right? Now, sometimes you can do uh, these documents electronically, but it is a piece of paper that is notarized or acknowledged before a notary public. Um, signed and delivered to the 
uh, recorded at the county recorder's office. So how do you go about doing this? Well, look at your deed. If you don't have your deed, look at your property tax bill. Your property tax bill frequently has the name. Not Don't go online and get it because they won't give you the information online. You got to look at the one that they actually mail to you. That typically has a name on it. Look at the name if it's your in your trust. If it's your trust name, it's in your trust. If it's in your name, it's probably not in your trust. So how do you get it in your trust? Call an estate planning lawyer. So this you typically want to go to the estate planning lawyer. It's very important to have some certain specific language on there. Otherwise, it could be problematic for your um, your successor trustee, right? Your future trustee. Attorneys typically prepare the deed. The deed is then notarized or acknowledged before notary public. And then we, um, our office, we handle that. So if this is you, if you say, yeah, I set up this trust and I don't have this piece of property in my trust, I need some help with that. Give us a call, reach out to us, and we can certainly help you with that. So there are different uh, type of uh, living, should say living trusts, types of living trusts. We have uh, revocable trusts, we have irrevocable trusts and land trusts. We don't really see those too often. And when you acquire the property, if you already have a trust, you can have the name of the trustee and the trust. And we'll have an example on that in a couple of slides. And then um, this is very important to understand. If you are buying property and you have a living trust, if you're buying property, you're not signing the deed. The person who's selling you or your trust, the property is signing the deed. So if you own the property, you get that property in your living trust by you signing a deed. If you're buying a new property and have a living trust, you can take title in the uh, in the name of the trust directly without having to go through that extra step of another deed. So there are two uh, two types of deeds. There's a grant deed and a quit claim deed. So a grant deed uh, comes with some warranties of title. Basically, if I'm granting property to somebody, I define what I am conveying, right? So I am conveying an undivided 100% interest in Greenacre. I'm conveying that to, uh, to, to Abel, right? So Jim to Abel, that's a grant deed. I grant that to Abel. Now, there's also this after acquired property issue. Sometimes if you acquire property later, uh, that automatically transfers. Uh, if you have some interest that pops up, it automatically transfers to the transferee. So a grant deed, a lot of times we're going to use those in the estate planning um, uh, situation. We tend not to use quit claim deeds for estate planning to fund your trust. And so a quit claim deed, it comes from the French quitte, which means to give, right, or transfer or to leave. So a quit claim deed says, I am quit. This is not a quick deed, like quick, like rapid. It's not a quick deed. It is a quit claim deed. And this deed says, whatever I own, whatever I happen to own, I might own, whatever I might not own, right? I am conveying that to Abel, for example. So Greenacre, I signed a quit claim deed. How will, how will Abel know that he's getting anything? Anyone can sign a quit claim deed, right? I could sign a quit claim deed on the White House. I don't own the White House. I guess, you know, as a citizen, it's the people's house, but I don't own it. The federal government owns it, right? So this is really important. So when you're going through like a title search, a quit claim deed, we don't give those, we give those different weighting than a grant deed. So if, if a person comes into our office and they say, I acquired this property through a quit claim deed, we're going to have to do a little bit of digging because we're not really sure necessarily what this person got because typically you're not 100% sure. There are no implied warranties, and there are um, these are often used in divorce proceedings to perfect title. They're pre frequently seen when spouses are financing property. Maybe if a, a spouse is taking title in his or her name as a uh, sole and separate property, you might see a quit claim deed from the spouse. So they do have their limited use, but we typically don't use a quit claim deed in the estate planning context. We're using a grant deed. So do not, okay, so just a point of confusion. Whoever came up with deeds of trust is very confusing to to the layperson, the non-lawyer or the non-real estate professional, don't use a trust deed or a deed of trust. This is a mortgage document, okay? Deeds of trust do not convey equitable title. So they deal with legal title. They deal with who has the right to control the property, not who owns the equity, hence equitable title, who actually owns the underlying property. So it's used for a non-judicial foreclosure. If you do not make your mortgage payment, they're going to warn you. And then somebody takes legal title. Typically, it's a title insurance company. They name themselves. They take legal title as trustee, and then they'll sell that property on the courthouse steps without having to go through a lawsuit to foreclose on the property. So it's a lot like a mortgage. You can think of it as a mortgage. This is not something you would do to convey title to property. Now, if you hold a deed of trust, maybe you lent somebody money and you hold a deed of trust, we execute an assignment of your deed of trust from you to your living trust. So it's an assignment. It's not a deed. It's a slightly different um, a slightly different format. So very important. If you're the lender, obviously it's an asset. You're going to want to deal with that. 
but not don't use that for con trying to convey title. All right, so if you have a living trust buying property with a living trust, you need to make sure that the trust allows, uh, gives you permission, gives a trustee permission to buy real estate. So one thing to understand about a trust, a trust has a trustee and there's also a written document. Now, in, in certain contexts, there, there's no written document that would be called a constructive trust, something totally different. What we're talking here is written documents. So a trust, a trustee only has the powers enumerated in the document. So if you uh, have a living trust and it says nothing about being able to own real estate, arguably the trustee can't deal with real estate. Now, do we see this in the real world? No. Do we see it with homemade living trust? Maybe somebody got a form off the internet and said, oh, this 80 pages is way too long. I'm going to cut this thing down to three. I'm going to cut out all that unnecessary language. Well, yeah, you might need that language if you want to own, uh, own real estate. So you direct the title company. So when you take title, if you buy a piece of property, and my wife and I bought a, a property a couple of years ago, and they gave us nine options as a married couple, nine options to pick, like, what? how do you want to take title to your property? And I really had to think about that. And I'm like, I do this every day. And I had to look at it and really kind of go through. I can't imagine just a normal person who doesn't have background on this. Like, what do you pick? So if it's your trust, the example we give here is John Smith, trustee or successor trustee of the Smith Living Trust, dated September 14, 2023, which happens to be today, the day of our recording, and any amendments there too. So it's not enough to name the trust. You name the person who is trustee, and it's very important here, and this is why we started with the difference between trustee and successor trustee, it is best practices to put the term successor trustee in there because John is going to be dead one day, right? We all die. And this trust will still be around. And so somebody else, you know, maybe Jane Smith steps in to handle uh, the, the trust administration and, and deal with those assets. You name the, the trust. Trusts typically have a date, not all, but it's best. Again, you should. It's kind of like, um, you know, washing your hands before you eat or brushing your teeth before bed. These are things that you should do that don't always happen. But the name of the trustee. Uh, the trustee, the, the John Smith, trustee or successor trustee, the Smith Trust with the date of the trust. And this is really critical. And any amendments there too, because a living trust is amendable. It's revocable. So it you can change it. So if it just says John Smith, trustee or successor trustee of the Smith Living Trust dated September 14, 2023 with a period, there may be a question as is this property, right? Subject to those subsequent amendments. And do people litigate this? Yeah. I mean, if the facts are there. So it's very important to, to have a correct format. And I would say this is best practice is the best format. The seller. So again, the seller is kind of funding your trust, which is kind of weird. It's Captain Obvious stuff. But you know, the seller signs a deed, conveys title to John Smith as trustee. And typically, the deed is recorded by the title company at your local friendly county recorder. Let's move on to funding your trust bank and brokerage accounts. So Bank accounts, you pretty much have to go to the bank. So you take your trust, you take your big, they ours come in a, in, a, in a binder with tabs because there are a lot of documents in there. And there's not just a trust, there's a will, there's durable power of attorney for property. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Healthcare documents, a lot of stuff in there. And what you need to do is identify your accounts. Now, you're not going to put in IRA accounts. So if you have an IRA account at a bank, uh, and we'll talk about brokerage accounts in, in, an, in a couple of slides. If you have IRA accounts, we're not putting those in. We're going to talk about that. We're talking about accounts that are in your name, not IRA 401k, 403b, TSA, those type of accounts. Contact the bank. Reach out to them. How do I fund this trust? Do I have to go to a specific branch? Do I have to make an appointment? Whatever it is. They will have forms that you complete. You're probably going to have to do a new signature card. You may have to open up a new account for that trust, or they may be able to change the name of the account and you use your own taxpayer use your own social security number as a taxpayer identification number for the trust. So you got to figure out which accounts and you can work with your lawyer. And if you're a client of ours or, or a future client, then we can go over with you and we actually give you letters that you can take to the bank. That's part of our, our service offering. And it kind of identifies the account and gives the bank instruction. So uh, you just kind of walk in and hand them the documents, but then you, the bank typically will help you complete the forms. And then the bank then changes the ownership and then you need to review your statements. So if you do get your statements electronically or by mail, look at them and hey, is, is the name of my trust on here or is it still my name? Okay. And then you got to rinse and repeat on for all your other accounts at all, all your various institutions. Brokerage accounts are uh, similar and I have a separate slide because a lot of brokerage accounts have what's called a household account. And this again, can be kind of... Um, kind of be uh, confusing for, for people who are not 
in this industry or this profession, a household account might have your IRA, might have a 401k, it might have a 529, it might have an annuity, right? It might have stocks and bonds, like a whole bunch of different things. So what we're talking about, and this is why you want to work with your, your um, financial advisor, is you want to make sure that your IRAs don't go into your living trust, and we'll explain why in, in a couple of slides. But you want to make sure that those brokerage accounts, you know, if in meeting with your lawyer and if it's with us, these are conversations that we have about funding your trust. Should these accounts be in this particular living trust? Yes or no? We identify those accounts and then we facilitate the contact with your advisor. Now, if you're working with one of our advisors on, on our A-team uh, or if, if you have this sort of A-team that we talk about in, in other webinars and other videos, uh, that happens to go pretty fast. It can get a little clunky if you're trying to do this on your own or don't really have a good relationship. Complete the required forms. Again, you're going to have forms. It's going to be like your bank accounts. And then the institution changes the ownership. And then you're going to get the statements. Very important. You need to look at those statements. Does the name of your trust appear on there? That's how you're verifying uh, if you your trust is funded. And then you, uh, again, rinse and repeat. Do this for your, if you have more than one, relationship or more than one brokerage account. But these, uh, I would say banks and brokerage accounts, I started practicing law 30 years ago doing estate planning. And it's, it was just a pain. No one knew how to do anything. Now it's, they're very familiar with trusts. Personal property, personal property, this is your stuff. Okay. Now, personal property, if it's tangible personal property, okay, that sometimes has a title, vehicles, airplanes, boats, they have titles. You know, if your boat's registered through the state, it's through the the um, through the state. If it's a a federal registry, it's through the United States government. So uh, these have titles. Okay, many of these uh, assets, uh, these can be actually quite valuable. The tangible personal property. What about stuff that doesn't have a uh, a title? Okay, what do we what do we do with the stuff that doesn't have a title? Well. We have a, a personal property memorandum. Typically, we have a document that says, I transfer all my personal property to my living trust. And then in our estate plan, this is sort of a mock-up, is we have this um, document and it's a personal property memorandum. I say, I give to my son, my guitars. I give uh, my daughters, you know, my wife might say, I give my daughters a jewelry. Sorry, son. Um, maybe I give my watch to my son. These are the, these are the type of things that don't uh, have a title. And then we, we say who gets those in this personal property memorandum. This is really the only place you can write on your estate plan. And this is something that um, people will look at after you pass away. So your successor trustee will look at this and they're in the trust. It says from time to time, I may make, make a writing and that's in this binder, right? From time to time, I may make a writing that says I give whatever personal property to whomever I want. This is a great way to make a gift of personal property without having to list all those items of personal property in your trust, because you know you have to pay a lawyer to amend that, and you know who wants to who wants to pay a lawyer a bunch of fees to amend you know kind of sentimental stuff, and that's why we use this um, this personal property memorandum. You can write it in and then scratch it out and and initial it. We don't really see a lot of conflict with this. That being said, if it is a personal property of significant value, um, you know art collectibles, you may want to put that in your living trust. And if you don't have an assignment of personal property to your trust, then you those are potentially a probate asset. And then that's where you have your, your what is called a pour over will. It's also called a pour over trust. So you have your living trust, which is this bucket with the handle. And then you have a will that says, if I have anything in my name when I die, I leave it to my living trust. Very important to have that. So if you have a living trust, if you have a well-crafted living trust, you should have a pour over will with it also called a pour over trust, even though it's a will. So how do you educate yourself? Well, the book Savvy Estate Planning, what you need to know before you talk to the right lawyer. Uh, that's in our second edition with uh, updates from the SECURE Act, which changed uh, retirement accounts, as well as our YouTube page. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you're already there. If you've never been to our YouTube page, check it out. And also our our webpage. So a lot of, uh, a lot of material, a lot of helpful material. And um, we have offices in Northern and Southern California. I happen to be in our Northern, one of our Northern California locations today, um, but we are close to many, many people throughout the state of California. We also meet on Zoom. A lot of, a lot of my meetings, frankly, are on Zoom and a lot of our, our client meetings are as well. If you're watching this on YouTube, you might've already seen this one. If you're past September 21, 2023, if you're watching this on YouTube, just keep watching because magically another video is going to pop up and I'm going to keep talking. 